We will now prove some corollaries to the Cauchy integral formula. So we begin proving some corollaries of the general Cauchy integral formula. First corollary states that if, if f is analytic in a domain D, then the derivative of f of any order is analytic in D as well. So then for any integer n greater than or equal to 0, the nth derivative of f evaluated at z is analytic in D as well. This is a consequence of the general Cauchy integral formula. We begin, let, let z0 be any point in D. Then we can find an epsilon neighborhood around z0 through, throughout which f is analytic. There's neighborhood of z0. I'll write this as half the value of z minus z0 is less than epsilon throughout which f is analytic. then we're going to let C be the positively oriented circle contained in this epsilon neighborhood. Let C be the positively oriented circle. Epsilon value of Z minus C zero equals epsilon over two. So we want this contour C to be con contained in the epsilon ball around z0 and by the general Cauchy integral formula we have that the nth derivative of f at z0 equals n factorial over 2 pi i times the integral over the contour c of f of s over the quantity s minus c0 to the power n plus 1 for each integer n greater than or equal to 0. Then for any given n, the nth derivative of f is differentiable, and therefore the nth derivative is analytic on d as well. So we see as a consequence of the general Cauchy integral formula that the nth derivatives of f are all analytic for any non-negative integer n. The next corollary is called Morera's theorem. So we're going to let f be continuous on a domain D. If the integral of f over contour c equals 0 for every closed contour c in D,
then we can conclude that f is analytic. Indeed. So when the hypothesis is satisfied, that is the integral of f around contour c equals zero for every closed contour c, then we proved in the lesson on antiderivatives that this implies that f has an antiderivative in d. So we have proven previously that this implies that f has an antiderivative in d. So there exists an analytic function capital F. such that derivative of capital F at Z equals F of Z for all Z in the domain D. But since F is the derivative of an analytic function, previous corollary implies that F is analytic. The next corollary is called Cauchy's inequality. Let f be analytic inside and on a positively oriented circle. I'm going to call the circle capital C sub R, where capital R is the radius, and the circle will be centered at the point Z0. And if the absolute value of F of Z is bounded by the non-negative number m for all z on the circle, then we can bound the nth derivative of f at z0. So the absolute value of the nth derivative of f evaluated at z0 will be less than or equal to n factorial times capital M over capital R to the power n, and this is for any positive integer n, one, two, so on. So again, the proof relies on the Cauchy integral formula. So by the general Cauchy integral formula, the nth derivative of f at c zero can be written as n factorial over 2 pi i times the integral over 
CR of f of z over t minus c0 to the power n plus 1 dz. And so the absolute value of these two quantities are equal. Now, by bringing the absolute value inside the integrand, we have that this quantity is less than or equal to the absolute value of n factorial over 2 pi i is n factorial over 2 pi times the integral over CR of the absolute value of f of z divided by the absolute value of z minus z0 to the power n plus 1 dz. But on the contour CR, the absolute value of z minus z0 equals r, so the integrand just equals absolute value of f of z over r to the power n plus 1. Then by the ML inequality, we have that this quantity is less than or equal to n factorial times 2 pi. And we're assuming that the absolute value of f of z is less than or equal to m. So the integrand is bounded by capital M over r to the n plus 1. The denominator equals capital R to the n plus 1 times the length of the contour, the circle centered at z0 with radius capital R has circumference 2 pi r, capital R, and when we simplify this, we get the desired expression n factorial times capital M over R to the N. So we see that the Cauchy integral formula gives us a bound for the size of the nth derivative of F at Z0. Our next result is Liouville's theorem, which will follow from Cauchy's inequality. So it states that if f is an entire function, and is bounded for all complex numbers z, then f must be a constant function. F is constant. So, in other words, the only entire bounded functions are constant functions. So, we begin the proof by letting C0 be an arbitrary complex number. Since f is entire, we can apply Cauchy's inequality. To obtain the first derivative of f evaluated at z0 will be less than or equal to capital M over R, where capital M is the non-negative constant that bounds the absolute value of f of z. Where M is a non-negative constant that bounds f so such that the absolute value of f of z is less than or equal to m for all complex numbers z and r is any positive constant. So we see that the absolute value of f prime of c0 will always be less than or equal to capital M over r 
Now R can be chosen arbitrarily large. R just has to be any positive value. So since we can make R arbitrarily large and M is a constant, we see that F prime of Z zero must actually be equal to zero. So we can make capital R arbitrarily large And thus, f prime of z0 must be equal to 0 in order for the absolute value of f prime of z0 to be less than or equal to m over capital R for any large value of r. But remember, z0 was arbitrary as well. So we see that f prime of z must be identically equal to zero on the whole complex plane. And we've proven earlier that if the derivative of f is identically equal to zero everywhere, then f must be a constant function. we see that the only bounded entire functions are constant functions by Liouville's theorem. Next we'll prove a key result on the zeros of polynomial functions, but first recall the definition of a zero of a function. So we say c is a zero of a function if f of c equals zero. So the next statement that we're going to prove is the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is a result on the zeros of polynomials. Fundamental theorem of algebra states that any polynomial p of c given by a zero plus a one z plus a2 c squared all the way up to a n z to the n with each of the a's being complex numbers and the nth coefficient a sub n is non-zero. So any nth degree polynomial any nth degree polynomial where n is greater than or equal to one with complex coefficients has at least one zero. So the proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra will rely on Liouville's theorem. So for a contradiction, suppose that p of z never equals zero. So p of, e, p of z does not equal zero for all complex numbers z. Then the reciprocal of p, so the function defined by f of z equals one over p of z, this function is an entire function since the denominator we're assuming never equals zero. Polynomials are entire functions, and so rational functions, one over p of z, will be analytic whenever the denominator is not zero. So this function, one over p of z, is an entire function. To get our contradiction, we will show that f of z is bounded And then 
use Leoville's theorem. to get a contradiction because that will show that f is entire and bounded and therefore constant which is impossible if f is 1 over a polynomial of degree n greater than or equal to 1. So now let's look at f of z in absolute value. So we have Absolute value of f of z equals the absolute value of 1 over p of z, which equals 1 over the absolute value of a0 plus a1z plus all the way up to a n z to the n. And I'm going to factor out the factor of z to the n in absolute value from each term. So this fraction is going to be written as 1 over absolute value of z to the n times the fraction 1 over the absolute value a0 over z to the n plus a1 over z to the n minus 1 all the way up to a sub n minus 1 over z plus a sub n, all in absolute value in the denominator. Now look at all of these little fractions in the denominator. As the absolute value of z goes to infinity, each one of these fractions will go to zero. And then we have, a, we'll be left with a constant a n times absolute value of z to the n. So again, this fraction will go to zero as well. So we see that as the absolute value of z goes to infinity, the limit of f of z is 0. So for k equals 1, 2, up to n, the absolute value of a n minus k over z to the k, this fraction goes to 0 as the absolute value of z goes to infinity. So by looking at the fraction above, we see that the absolute value of f of z will go to 0 as f of z goes to infinity. We see that each one of these fractions in the expression of above, this goes to 0, goes to 0, to zero, all these little fractions go to zero. So we get one over a sub n times zero, which is zero. So if the absolute value of f of z approaches zero as the absolute value of z goes to infinity, then there's some radius capital R such that if the absolute value of z is greater than capital R, then the absolute value of f of z will be less than or equal to one. So, in particular, we can find a positive value r such that the absolute value of f of z will be less than or equal to 1 whenever z in absolute value is greater than r. In other words, capital F is bounded on the region exterior to the disk center of the original radius capital R. F is bounded in the region exterior to the disk. Five z less than or equal to capital R. But f is a continuous function inside this closed disk. So 
since f is continuous inside that closed disk, we have proven that by the continuity that f is bounded on this closed disk as well. So f is bounded there too. So for any finite value r, capital R, the continuous function f is bounded on the disk centered at the origin with radius r. And then we showed that f is also bounded on the region exterior to this disk. So therefore, f is a bounded entire function. So by Theoville's theorem, since f is bounded entire, f is constant, and since f is 1 over p of z, we see that this implies that p of z is also constant. This is a contradiction because we assume that P was a polynomial of degree N. So since we get a contradiction, we have therefore proven that P of Z must have at least one zero. We can, it can be shown that if C is a zero of P of Z, then the polynomial of z minus c is a factor of p of z. So then this statement can be used to prove the factorization of p of z into linear factors.